This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. On Friday, a white former police officer charged with killing unarmed African-American teenager Antoine Rose in East Pittsburgh last year was acquitted. Video of the June 19th shooting shows Officer Michael Rosfeld shot Rose in the back while the teenager was trying to flee a traffic stop. Rosfeld had been sworn in to the city's police department just three hours before the shooting. At a vigil Sunday, Rose's mother, Michelle Kenny, said she would continue to fight for justice for her son. The problem is the law. The problem isn't the individual. If we rewrite the law, then all individuals got to abide by it. So we got, that's where we got to start at. So, no, it's not over for me. I got, I got a long fight ahead of me, a long fight. We got to rewrite the law. And one way or the other, Michael Rossfeld got an answer for what he did. To answer. This comes after massive protests in Sacramento, California, earlier this month, after the county's district attorney announced the two police officers who shot and killed 22-year-old unarmed African-American Stefan Clark in his grandmother's backyard last year will not face criminal charges. Since the news broke, organizers have joined walkouts at local colleges, high schools, demonstrations at the Sacramento City Council, an ongoing occupation of a Sacramento police station a die-in at UC Davis, University of California, Davis, and a protest in one of Sacramento's wealthiest neighborhoods that led to 84 arrests. To discuss these developments and more, we continue our conversation with Jennifer Eberhardt. She's professor of psychology at Stanford University, recipient of a 2014 MacArthur Genius Grant. Her new book, just out this week, is titled Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice That Shapes What We See, think and do. Thank you so much for staying with us. So, yes. we talk about what happened in Pittsburgh uh, right before that, um, not bringing charges against the officers and the killing of Stefan Clark. You've done a lot of work on killings of African Americans, police killings of African Americans. Talk about it. You know, my, my, I've done a lot of work with police departments. Um, uh, a lot of my work, though, focuses more on um, sort of uh, routine interactions between uh, police and, and community. And, I mean, um, these— um, you know, those routine interactions actually feed into, you know, what happens with, with the officer-involved shootings. Um, uh, and I think, um, in a way, uh, when, when we have these um, encounters with the police, um, there's a history there. There's a history of either trust or mistrust that um, um, can uh, sort of feed into how these interactions unfold. But a lot of that is happening. Um, there's, a, there's a background to it of just, like, regular sort of routine um, uh, you know, contact with the public. And even with one of the, the shootings, right, it was a traffic stop. And I've studied traffic stops uh, a lot to try to understand how these interactions unfold and how trust can be built or eroded um, inside, um, you know, this, this brief interaction and looking at that across thousands of these interactions so to try to, to analyze it. So talk to us specifically about that. Yes. Yeah, well, this, this is work that I'm doing uh, in collaboration with a number of uh, researchers at Stanford. It's a interdisciplinary collaboration with linguists and computer scientists and social psychologists. And together, we're um, using this machine learning approach to actually analyze footage from body-worn cameras. Those cameras allow us to see you know, interactions as they're unfolding in real time. And so we get a much better handle on, um, you know, you know what's going on and, and, and um, you know, how people might uh, leave an interaction feeling either better about the police or worse about the police. It also allows us to see, um, you know, uh, how, um, you know, police may respond differently to uh, uh, black drivers, say, in traffic stops as opposed to white how do drivers. That? Well, we find that there's a difference of respect. We call it a um, a uh, respect uh, deficit. And so we see um, officers speaking uh, in a more respectful ways to whites uh, from the beginning of the stop to the end. And so if you look at how they greet uh, white drivers, they will, you know, greet them with sir and ma'am, and they uh, are more likely to greet um, black drivers with bro and dude. So so just at the beginning of the stop, it, it, there's, a, there's a difference. Um, and then also throughout the stop, uh, they offer more um, 
some reassurance to white drivers more so than uh, black drivers. So for white drivers, they'll kind of walk them through the procedure. If they're getting a ticket, what to do, offer them reassurance, say, you know, it'll be okay, you know, don't worry. Um, black drivers, you know, less so. Um, and then uh, even towards the end of the stop, um, they're expressing concern for the safety of the white driver a lot more uh, than they do for the black driver. So we're in really different worlds here, you know, black drivers and white drivers uh, when they come into contact with the police. Well, you also write in the book about your own experience uh, just the day before you completed your PhD or graduated with a PhD from Harvard. Yes. At a traffic stop, what happened? Yes, yeah, so we were. Um, I was driving with the girlfriend. We were uh, pulled over for a minor traffic violation, and um, I, uh, the the officer, spoke to us um, in a really uh, disrespectful tone, uh, actually, and I ended up uh, being body slammed on the roof of my car, um, handcuffed and arrested. Well, um, explain so how it started. <laughs> uh, you have very good reason to make this the basis of your research. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was way back when I was in my— tw I mean, this was like 25 years ago this happened, but, yeah. I explain mean, was, where you were and why this happened. I was in Boston. Uh, We—I was driving uh, with a friend who lived in the housing complex that was kind of um, uh, mixed, uh, you know, socioeconomic status, you know, and, and mixed race. Uh, and, um, you know, I think— uh, the location uh, might have played a role there, too, uh, in just in how they typically treated people, and especially black people uh, who live there. Um, so it's kind of like, um, I, I think, the, the, the location and then also— um, I think the 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 um, the point in time this was in the country. So this was in the 90s, where you know crime was um, high, much higher than it is now, and um, you know police departments uh, use these um, routine traffic stops for minor violations to kind of pull people over and check them out, and you know sort of make sure they weren't up to any criminal activity. And, and it's so legal; it's perfectly legal. But this was the strategy that they used to fight crime. So how did you end up getting body slammed? Well, I refused to get out of the car. Um, so, so the we the the officer was just so um, rude to us from the beginning to the end. He wouldn't explain why he pulled us over. Um, he. Um, he just wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, sort of speak to us about what, what was going on or inform us about uh, what was about to happen. But uh, the, the, I had expired tags. They were <laughs> expired by, I think, six weeks as I was working on my dissertation to um, finish, to, to graduate from Harvard. And uh, he called the tow truck, and we didn't know what was happening. And he just appeared, you know, at my door and told me to exit the vehicle. The car was being towed. Um, the, the tags were expired. And so I just said, no, you know, I'm not getting out. You know, this was—I was in my 20s. I was having my uh, Rosa Parks moment, right? I'm going to sit here. And so that decision just, you know, you know, just— um, I didn't realize the significance of that decision. I'll, I'll say that because um, he uh, called for backup. There were they, there ended up being five cruisers surrounding our car, uh, police cruisers. There there was a crowd that gathered on the street, and um, so it went from you know for, for me uh, from defiance to fear. This like, reminds I, I me of Sandra really, Bland. Yeah, maybe it, maybe it was like that. I, I was I don't know if she became fearful. I mean, I think she, she was, was very definitely fearful. She didn't want to get defiant. out of her car. She got out of her car. He ended up body slamming her to the ground. Yeah. And a few days later, after taken to jail, she yeah. was found dead in her cell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you so, talk? Go ahead. go ahead. So, yeah. So, I, I think um, the fear kept me in the car, um, you know, after I saw all what had, you know, what was, uh, you know, we, what we were, what we were in the center of. Um, but well, you've worked, Jennifer, with the Oakland Police Department. Can you talk about what kind of trainings, what you've learned about the implicit bias uh, uh, that police officers have that lead to this kind of behavior, and what kind of work you, you did with them? Right. So, so again, I mean, implicit bias is something that we're all vulnerable to. It's, it's not something that is, um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, police officers are, are experiencing oh, no, only. No. Yeah, but, but, but the, the issue with police officers is just the, the power that they have, you know, in their decision making and, um, you know, the consequences uh, of that bias. And so we want to be sort of especially attentive uh, to them. Yeah. And so I was uh, called in uh, to Oakland, California, to work with the police department on their reform efforts. 
efforts. They had some uh, scandals and issues in the past, and I was um, uh, called in to help them to um, analyze, um, uh, you know, uh, data that they were collecting on uh, the race of, uh, of, of people that they were stopping, either pedestrians or uh, drivers. And I was to sort of analyze that stop data and to see if there were racial disparities in who they were stopping and searching and arresting uh, so and so forth. And we found that that was the case, but we also uh, wanted to um, explore more. And so um, we used the um, footage uh, that comes, the body-worn camera footage that is, um, um, you know, that um, uh, documents the stop. Uh, we analyzed that as well and, and found these, you know, big differences um, for traffic stops and how officers are, um, are uh, speaking to black versus white drivers. So they're professional overall, but there's a, a respect uh, difference there. So you talk about this respect deficit. What do police officers say? I mean, you're right in there. You're right in the police stations when right. you're consulting with them. Um, when you confront them on these issues, how do they respond? Uh, <laughs> well, that depends. Uh, sometimes uh, in a defensive way, you know, sometimes in a way where, um, you know, they actually sort of acknowledge, um, you know, that, that, you know, well, this, maybe this is something that we could work on. And in this particular case, um, with the analysis of the body-worn camera footage, uh, the department actually invited us to help them, um, assist them in developing a training on the, on the traffic stop, and it focused on the language use of officers. And so that was a good response. Um, well, I mean, you've, you've just spoken specifically about concerns about implicit bias. Of course, you say that everybody is, uh, um, has an implicit bias of some kind. But with the police, it's, it's particularly uh, uh, possibly injurious because of the power that they have. Yes. And that presumably is true with all, uh, uh, both people as well as institutions that have a lot of power. But what, I mean, in your book, you also talk about just the quotidian, everyday uh, yes. uh, kind of violence that this kind of implicit bias can inflict. So can you talk about more everyday situations and what the impact of this kind of bias is or can be? I mean, I mean, so it's, it's everywhere in every um, sort of corner of life, really. I mean, I think... Um, you know, there's uh, evidence for bias, whether we're, like, in our neighborhoods or in our workplaces or in our schools, um, in our criminal justice system, and not just with the police, but in the courtroom, in the prisons, you know. So um, there isn't, like, a, a corner that, that it, it can't reach. And um, and it has, like you say, uh, um, you know, can have pretty negative uh, consequences for the targets uh, of that bias. Uh, so, for example, if we just want to look at, at neighborhoods, um, I've done um, studies with uh, colleagues um, where we've shown that, um, you know, when a black family is, is, is selling their home, you know, uh, that home is worth um, about $22,000 less uh, than the identical home uh, that's being sold uh, by a white family. Um, and so there's a way in which, um, you know, uh, just living in that Do home Do realtors for say to black families, when we're showing this house, don't be here, take down your family pictures. Yes. Don't yeah. let them know. I mean, they, show, they say that, that for everyone, but I think it's especially important uh, for um, African Americans. I think um, there's a way—I mean, we think about bias as something that's just uh, about people, right, that, that we can have—you know, we're prejudiced against certain people or, or we're, we have stereotypes about those people. Um, but um, it's more than that. The bias can—the target of bias can actually uh, be, um, you know, sort of reach beyond people and go to, um, you know, places. And and things. And so this is an example of that, where we can have a bias against, you know, uh, you know we, can, we can express a bias against a house, right? Um, because mm -hmm. you're going to evaluate that house uh, more negatively uh, when a black person has lived in it. Um, it's, it's as though, you know, their presence in, in that house. Um, I mean, they're not living in the house with you. I mean, they're moving out, right? But the fact that they have once lived in that house can, uh, you, know, um, you know, it taints it. Um, uh, and and, and just because they've lived there. Do you see a difference between, I mean, your book is called Biased, mm -hmm. between biased and racism? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, there's a difference. I mean, so, you know, again, implicit bias is something that we're all vulnerable to. Um, I think um, when people think about uh, racism or old-fashioned racism, you know, they're thinking, you know, you know, this is kind of a select group of, of, of people who, um, you know, are um, sort of hate-filled uh, people or they're, you know, they're, they're bad people. But for implicit bias, you don't have to be a bad person um, to um, be affected by that kind of a bias, to hold it, to experience it. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, more pervasive than this old-fashioned racism. Uh, but it also, but it could have, you know, effects that, that are just as bad. It, you could think about it as, like, old-fashioned racism being um, sort of this acute form of, of bias, whereas this um, implicit bias being more chronic. Um, it's something that we live with, that can flare up, that we have to manage. But uh, ultimately, when we don't manage it, it can, it can mm -hmm. inflict a lot of damage. Well, I want to go to, to one of the uh, examples that you give in your book of the kind of imagery that informs some of this uh, uh, bias. Uh, the book includes a section on ape imagery and the issue of black ape association. I want to look back at a few examples of this over the past few years. This is former Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld in a 2014 appearance on Fox News when he said a trained ape could do a better job in Afghanistan than President Obama. Our relationship with Karzai and with Afghanistan was absolutely first rate in the Bush administration. It has gone downhill like a toboggan uh, ever since the Obama administration came in. Now, uh, take, for example, the fact that we have status of forces agreement probably with 100, 125 countries in the world. This administration, the White House and the State Department, have failed to get a status of forces agreement. A, tr a trained ape could get a status of forces agreement. It does not take a genius. So that's Donald Rumsfeld speaking about Barack Obama in 2014. That wow. is just uh, five years ago. In 2016, a West Virginia government worker sparked outrage after calling Michelle Obama, quote, an ape in heels. Pamela Ramsey Taylor was the director of the Clay County Development Corporation. She made the comments in a social media post after Donald Trump's election victory. The mayor of Clay, Beverly Whaling, resigned after responding to the post, quote, just made my day, Pam, end quote. And last year, ABC canceled its hit show, Roseanne, after its star, Roseanne Barr, fired off a series of racist comments on Twitter. In one tweet, Roseanne wrote, quote, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals VJ, unquote. It was a reference to Valerie Jarrett, an African-American who's a longtime advisor to President Obama. So, uh, Jennifer, can you respond to some of those extremely recent uh, uh, comments and, and the issues that you raise in your book uh, right. with respect to, to this black ape imagery? Right. I mean, so that black ape imagery is, is, is still w with us. Um, um, it's, it's interesting because it uh, brings up an, another conversation we were having about uh, the role of, of social norms and the, um, the uh, relationship between implicit bias and this more explicit bias. Um, I, I did some work uh, a little while ago now, um, in around 2008 or so, with uh, Philip Goff, who's a former um, graduate student at Stanford, now is a professor um, uh, here um, in, in New York. And uh, we, we worked together on a series series of studies um, looking at this uh, Black Ape Association and found um you know, evidence, you know, that, um, you, you know, it's still uh, present in everyday people. So, so again, your clips, you know, suggesting that maybe it's the few isolated, um, you know, people who are out there who hold the, these terrible views. But we were finding um, evidence for this association with just, like, everyday students and, you know, everyday, you know, sort of people who were out in the world, and even though they didn't know they had that association um, at the time. I mean, this was before, um, you know, we were conducting the studies. Before 
before Barack Obama became president for the first time. And people weren't—I um, mean, this was something that was in the past, and a lot of the young students hadn't thought about it, didn't know about it, that this Black Ape Association. But they were showing evidence for it in our studies. And so, if we um, set them in front of a computer screen and we um, flashed, um, you know, African-American faces uh, at them at a really quick rate so they couldn't uh, sort of consciously, um, you know, pick up what we were um, um, flashing at them, and then we, sh you know, showed them images of various animals. Uh, blurry images of those animals, they um, were able to, um, you know, pick out uh, the ape um, imagery uh, a lot faster after being exposed to black faces as opposed to white faces, right? So it, the black faces facilitated their ability to pick out these apes. And we've also um, shown—we we had other studies uh, that we've done where we've um, exposed them to words associated with apes, right? Chimpanzees and, you know, apes and gorillas and words like that, right? Again, flash the words on the computer screen such a rapid rate they can't consciously read uh, what they're being exposed to, but they're, but this is a way that we can get them to think about uh, this concept of apes. And then we put um, two faces on the computer screen simultaneously, a black face and a white face, and we simply look at which face they look at. If they've been exposed to the ape imagery, their eyes go uh, straight for the black face. So, so their eyes are directed away from the white face and towards the black face. Uh, we also were showing that this— um, Ape imagery can um, actually matter outside of the laboratory, um, you know, in, in police departments, for example. Mm. Um, so what we uh, did was um, we um, we had people look at a video of a um, police altercation where they had a, a suspect on the ground and they were beating the suspect with a baton, but you couldn't see the suspect. You couldn't see the suspect's face. So that allowed us to manipulate um, what the, the subjects thought they saw, right? So, so we gave them a mugshot and we said, hey, this is the suspect. Either the mugshot was of a white person or the mugshot was of a black person. And what we found was, is when the mugshot was of a black person, and we um, exposed them to this ape imagery uh, beforehand, and they looked at this video, they thought um, that black person deserved what he got, um, that, um, you know, he brought that kind of um, uh, beating onto himself and so forth. And so the ape imagery, um, you know, s served this uh, function of, of kind of uh, endorsing, um, you know, uh, police um, uh, use of force against African Americans. But even if you hadn't shown the ape, if you had just said this person there that's getting beaten on the ground, they can't see the color, but you say it's white, or you say the person is black, um, would they be more likely to say the black person on the ground deserved the beating? In this case, they weren't. Um, and, and but but the thing that so they were. I mean, I, mean, I think you know sometimes. I mean, it kind of depends on um, you know who your participants are and, and so forth. But uh, in this case, in this particular case, we didn't see a, a, a race difference there without the ape. It was the ape imagery that produced this huge difference in um, what they thought was appropriate in terms of police behavior. So that's the other thing. I mean, we sometimes we just sort of talk about. Um, you know the the police and that that they could have this potential bias and, and and so forth and there's something going on with them but sometimes it's what's going on with us you know sometimes you know it's it's sort of you know them acting on what they um, sort of think um, the people want and, and and how what role they think that um, you know people want them to serve in the community so what comes of that you do that research so mm -hmm. what do you think is the answer coming out of that research well, I mean, it, it's showing us that things that we think we've dealt with, we have not. Um, and again, this work was done before o Barack Obama became president. Once he became president, all of that lifted—I mean, that, that was brought to the surface. Um, we were seeing things and hearing mm -hmm. things, comments about uh, black people looking like apes and so forth you were uh, that we didn't hear before. Doing mm -hmm. all that research. Mm -hmm. You still, when you watch that Donald Rumsfeld comment on Fox yeah. talking about uh, Obama as an ape, right? yeah. Donald Rumsfeld, the former defense secretary, talking about uh, President Obama comparing him to an ape, um, you were surprised. You just you uttered uh, a shock when you saw that. Well, it was hard to witness. Um I mean, just, I mean, knowing this as a social scientist and dealing with the data and, um, you know, writing, um, you know, up the studies uh, is, 
that that's what I do, and I kind of re remove myself in order to be able to observe that and to uh, document it and so forth and think about it. Um, and theorize about it, but just it's a different. Uh, it, there's a visceral. There was a visceral reaction to, to hearing and that comment. And it's especially. I mean, it's already horrific that the association is made at all. But in yeah. fact, he compares him unfavorably to Obama, saying that yeah. an ape would have done a better job yeah. than Obama does. Yeah. Well, I want to go now to to Stacey Abrams, whose narrow loss in the race for Georgia governor earned her widespread praise, and she's now considering a run for president or a seat in the Senate. This is MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell speaking with Abrams Wednesday. You and Andrew Gillum came uh, way closer to winning your races than Beto O'Rourke did. Um, how do you feel about all the publicity, the campaign that Beto O'Rourke has, has gained by the listening tour, you know, cooking at home, going to the dentist, uh, his online presence, his fundraising? Um, why Beto O'Rourke and not Andrew Gillum and not Stacey Abrams as, you know, the, the darling of the media? I don't think that success is zero sum, so I don't want to disparage or take away from the reaction and the legitimate response people had to his campaign. But I do want to take to call the question. There is no difference with the dis there's no distinction with the difference between what he accomplished and what Andrew and I accomplished. And I would challenge people to consider why we were not lifted up in the same way. I think race plays a part. I think uh, region plays a part. I also think phenotype plays a part. My responsibility, then, is to credibly investigate running for president, because I want people to understand that I may not look like the typical candidate, but that does not diminish my capacity to possibly run for this job. And the same would be true for Andrew, if that was something he was interested in. So that's Stacey Abrams speaking on Wednesday to MSNBC. Yes. And she asked the question, why were we not lifted up in the same way, Andrew Gillum and her versus Beto O'Rourke? Right. And, and she points to race, she points to phenotype, and she points to location, right? So so those are the kinds of things. I'm, so so it's hard to know in any one case, right, uh, whether how much race is playing a role or whether it's playing a role. But the, but the beauty of science is that we can actually um, create studies where we can isolate those different factors. We can, you know, present people uh, with the same situation, the same case where we, you know, vary the race of the actor or we can vary the phenotype of, of a black person who looks more stereotypically black or less stereotypically black and look at the, the impact of that on the decisions that get made about that person. Um, or we can change the location, too. And, um, you know, we've, um, you know, we've, we've, so we've done all of these things. We have the capacity to actually look for answers um, um, so, um, uh, to explore that uh, scientifically so that we can see whether, you know, the extent to which race is playing a causal role um, in, in all of these um, cases. Well, in the stereotypical way um, that you're indicating, what, what what does a, a, a black person look like? What are stereotypical black uh, uh, features as they are uh, perceived in the in the popular imagination? Well, I mean, I, th I think uh, when we've done studies, uh, we've asked people to rate faces, say, on how stereotypically black uh, they are. And people can do this even when you don't give them any instruction. We tell them, use whatever features, you know, you want. Um, um, we want you to rate these faces from sort of uh, low to high in stereotypicality. And there's huge agreement on that. Um, and I think what people are using is the, um, the skin shade, the darkness of the skin, the broadness of the nose, the thickness of the lips. They're looking at the hair texture. Um, so people have, you know, high agreement on what it means to be stereotypically black or less so. And, and, and it matters a lot. It matters uh, for uh, assumptions of criminality. So we've done studies before um, with police officers where we just showed them a series of faces of, of, of black people that varied on how stereotypically black they were and found that they judged uh, more of the faces that were highly stereotypically black to be criminal than those that were less stereotypical. Um, we've also looked at this in the courtroom uh, with death um, sentencing uh, cases. And uh, we found uh, that the more black you looked, um, the um, more likely uh, you were to get a death sentence, at least if your victim was white. 
Um, and for that that study, we used an archival uh, database of um, you know many different cases uh, of um, crimes that were uh, committed in Philadelphia over a 20 year period. And so these were actual cases um, that had actual verdicts with actual you know uh, jury members, and um, we uh, were able to get the photographs of the people in that database who committed uh, or, or accused of um, uh, found guilty of committing those crimes. And um, so so. We gave those uh, faces to raiders to have them judge them on how stereotypically black the faces were. And these raiders had no idea who these people were, where we got the faces, what the study was about. They just looked at the face and rated it. And we were able to use their ratings to predict whether someone got a death sentence or a life sentence. And in fact, it, you know, looking more black more than doubled um, the defendant's chance of getting a death sentence. Finally, Professor so. Eberhardt, as you head off on your book tour, um, your book, Bias, just out this week. You've been doing this work for many years. Yes. What surprised you most in your research? I think the most surprising finding—well, two, actually. One was the study we did about um, the death penalty and looking at the role that the stereotypicality of a defendant's face can play, um, you know, in the outcome, or at least there's an association there. The more black you are, um, the more likely you are to be sentenced to death, um, um, at least if your victims are white. Um, That—I mean, the fact that that it seemed that doubled your chances of getting a uh, death penalty was, you know, just the, the magnitude of the f- effect was uh, was big for, for us, and I didn't expect that. I think the work that we've done on the ape imagery um, was also surprising. Um, not surprising in the sense that, um, you know, I was surprised to find it there. I mean, we, we, we thought that there would be something like it there, but what we weren't prepared for was just how strong it was. You know, that association, that black ape association is even stronger uh, than the black crime association. Even though when we were conducting the studies, people weren't talking about this, people never, you know, never said anything about black people looking like apes. But, um, you know, so that so that was surprising. And then, um, with the election of uh, Barack Obama uh, for, for the first time to the presidency, you know, people, you know, I think that did bring things to the surface. So by the time we um, finished the studies and um, the studies were out and we would talk about the studies at uh, scientific conferences and so forth, what what surprised me <laughs> was uh, people's reaction. So, so I thought that um, we would have to do lots of studies, um, you know, to, to be able to really, like, show that this was the case, that there still was this black ape association and that it was a strong association. And what I found instead was um, that people were um, — it was almost as though they thought that was a given. Um, that blacks were associated with apes. And I would get questions about, well, what else would you expect? And that, you know, black people just look more similar to apes than whites. Um, and um, I just, um, yeah, I didn't expect that. So so that reaction uh, was probably, it was pr- surprising, but also, um, yeah, it was shocking, actually, um, for, for, for scientists to, um, you know, sit in a room and, uh, and uh, just feel like um, those associations are natural and, and, and normal, that there's nothing to even study there, uh, because there's such a connection, an obvious visual um, connection between, you know, blackness and uh, this ape image. Jennifer Eberhardt, we want to thank you so much for spending this time with us, professor of psychology at Stanford University, recipient of the 2000 2014 MacArthur Genius Grant, her new book just out this week, Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice That Shapes What We See, Think and Do. To see part one of our conversation, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.